just to clarify, I'm Lara, it's my colleague Kay. Um, so today uh, we will be talking about um, the um, two key case studies of projects that we've worked on um, in which the information about the heritage of the area has been used to inform the design, both in terms of um, mitigation by design um, to uh, avoid or reduce um, adverse impacts to heritage, um, but also how it's been used to inform the identity of the proposed development. Um, so we'll be looking at the whole, whole life cycle of uh, design and construction activities um, and our paper is uh, broadly kind of structured along, along these four um, key phases um, from the, the feasibility and the option selection phase um, through to the legacy, um, hopefully at the end of the project. Um, as has been touched on already today, obviously a lot of our work as archaeologists falls within the, the pre-application and the mitigation stage of projects. Um, but uh, we want to talk a bit about um, how we can also provide valuable inputs both before and after that. So moving on, so the first project we'll be looking at today, um, this, is, uh, this is a National Grid uh, project and it was uh, required to replace the existing high pressure gas pipeline, the feeder number nine, um, which uh, passes under the Humber estuary uh, between Gox Hill uh, in North Lincolnshire and um, Paul in East Riding Yorkshire. Um, so because this was a, uh, a replacement of an existing piece of infrastructure, there was various kind of constraints about the location of this. Um, it needed to connect in to the existing above ground installations, the AGIs, on each side of the river. Um, and the, the primary aim was to uh, create a board tunnel under the Humber um, at a deeper depth than the current one to avoid um, impacts from um, the, uh, the sort of scouring of the riverbed, which was eroding the, the current uh, pipeline. So, and apologies because I think this figure doesn't look great on this huge screen. Um, there were four route options for the, uh, the pipeline under the Humber, and there were obviously options for the corresponding both drive and reception shaft sites. Um, I should add that the drive was from Gox Hill uh, to Paul. So what you can see here is the options for the uh, route corridors and the reception shaft sites at Paul. And in our option selection for this, our key focus was on um, avoiding or reducing impacts to designated heritage assets. Um, and this was particularly important on the pool side of the river because there was quite a large number of these um, in quite close proximity to the options. Um, so on this one, you can just see um, in a little bit more detail where these are located. Um, I'd mostly like to draw your attention to the two little blue triangles um, on Thorn Gumbled Clough, um, which are the low lighthouse and the high lighthouse there. And they're both grade two listed. And this is some illustration of them. The white lighthouse is the low lighthouse and the red is the high lighthouse. Just a little picture of actual heritage assets there. Um, so to go back to the option selection, um, our key advice um, with regard to the, uh, the tunnel route options was that they, two of them, um, two of the options passed underneath these lighthouses. And so our key advice was not to tunnel underneath them um, because of the potential for impacts from vibration um, or from hydrological changes, which might result in settlement. And in both cases, this could obviously affect the historic fabric of the buildings. Um, and so on the basis of this advice, two of the corridors were discounted. Um, the other key concern we had um, from the heritage um, perspective was regarding the, the specific location of the re reception shaft on this side of the river. And this was in relation to the scheduled and grade one listed um, Paul Home uh, medieval motor site and tower, um, which is just in the top image, uh, it's a little yellow hatch area in the bottom right corner over there. Um, and so we were concerned that if the, if the construction activity um, was in very close proximity to these, then there would be changes to the setting um, of the asset that might damage its significance. Um, so we basically advised to site the reception shaft as far away from that as possible. And so um, on the basis of this advice, um, two options were selected, which are the, the black and the blue dots in the uh, bottom left figure here. And um, this was obviously, this provided kind of a, from particularly from the heritage point of view, this was a balance between um, the, the kind of constraints on either side. Um, and in this way, luckily, it managed to, uh, we kind of reduced or, or entirely removed um, negative impacts. Um, there are also a variety of other constraints. The, the colour coding on the image is to do with other environmental constraints as well. So 
please also have to take into account. So moving on to the pre-application phase, um, I'm not going to talk in very much detail about this for this project because this is something that Kate's going to talk about in, uh, in far more detail, but just to provide you with the um, sort of background for this one. Um, obviously, we produced a DDA with a walkover. Um, we commissioned um, aerial photo and LIDAR analysis um, for the pool side. We had information on crop marks from the North Lincolnshire HDR for the Gox Hill side, so um, we already had that information. Um, we did a geophysical survey on uh, both sites. Um, and we did trial trenching at uh, Gox Hill and a paleoenvironmental assessment at Call because it was quite deep alluvium on that side of the river, so that was a, a better way to kind of understand what was going on there. Um, just one thing I want to mention in relation to the walkover, we identified a, um, a, a brick-built feature of unusual style. It's quite low, only a few courses high above the ground, and um, sort of roughly circular arrangement, um, which I will be completely honest, at the time when I looked at it, I didn't know what it was at all. Um, I just want to draw that to your attention. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail a bit later on. Um, so now I'm going to pass over to Kate, who's going to talk in a bit more detail about baseline data gathering and how that can inform master planning. Hi. Um, I'd like to talk to you about um, Otterpool Park, which is a, a new garden settlement in um, East Kent that Arcadis have been helping to design. Um, and we've just prepared the environmental impact assessment for, and it's just currently gone in for outline planning permission. Um, really want to talk about the value of the historic environment and the value of what we do as heritage professionals, um, including obviously consultants and field archaeologists, in terms of creating um, cultural identity and uh, a sense of place in these new communities and places that are going to be um, created, um, such as Otterpool. Uh, I'd like to highlight the involvement of the archaeological consultants from very early on and um, how, along with other environmental professionals, we can try and develop um, a bit of a long-term sort of strategic vision for a place um, and also work in a collaborative way and have that joined-up thinking to really bring public benefit. So with Otterpool, we would hope that um, our aspiration is that the public benefit would not just be for our client but for... Um, the public and for the stakeholders as well. So a bit about Otterpool, it's um, near Folkestone, it's the red site um, just bounded by the HS1 high speed railway there. Um, it's um, 580 hectares, uh, the plan is for mixed use development of 8,500 homes. Uh, it's wrapped around, the green area is um, an AONB, um, it's the north, it's the Kent Downs. Um, the client is the District Council, folks in the Hive. Um, a bit about their vision, because we're talking about taking the developer's vision back in history. So obviously they needed to fulfil a housing quota and they decided to do that by creating a new town rather than extending development around existing settlements. Um, they wanted to create a landmark garden town. I can't call it a town until it's 10,000 houses, so <laughs> to call it a garden settlement. Um, uh, but they wanted heritage to be a key contributing factor um, and to, to bring garden pr city principles of combining the best of urban and rural um, to this new place. They wanted it to be landscape led and to have a high um, proportion of green space. Um, so that's just where it is in a bit more detail. The red line is the outline planning application boundary and I wanted to draw your attention to. Um, the scheduled monument right on the edge of the site, which is uh, Western Hanger Castle. Uh, it's not within our red line, but it's obviously a key heritage asset right on the doorstep. And you can see it as a constraint, but we're also seeing it as a real opportunity. Um, and a lot of our work has gone into understanding the castle and its landscape and its setting, and how to incorporate the setting of the castle into this new, this new town. Um, <clears throat> various other uh, designated sites around it. Um, also, just uh, there's a race course here, Folkestone um, Race Course, which is no longer in use. Um, also, um, RAF Lim occupies this whole southern area here. Uh, whoops. Um, World War I and World War II airfield. So, as well as having a castle, <laughs> um, 
we also got an airfield and we also had um we knew that there was prehistoric barrows um so that's why i had a lot of potential um <clears throat> Uh, yes, the LIDAR, very good for spotting barrows. <laughs> um, just put the slide in, I didn't want to focus too much about baseline gathering because I think we're all familiar with what that involves and the various test studies that then feed into the field evaluations. But we did do a very deep dive on this project, um, we were very specific um, in what we were looking at and we did a lot of this early on so we got involved at, towards the end of 2016 and then the field work started at the end of 2017. So a lot of work's done before that happens, and the two kind of feed into each other. Um, more about the field work now. The early, uh, yes, the early involvement um, also included getting involved with the stakeholders and um, Historic England being key and Kent County Council archaeologists. So we started very early consultation with them about what they what they wanted to see. Um, the client was quite invested in heritage, obviously, which is a good thing. Um, the client was the district council, and they very much saw it as an opportunity and something that's going to make this new town so it's distinctive. And um, the, um, they also appreciated having early warnings about potential risks or archaeological showstoppers, and just doing a lot of work early on. Um, help reduce, give them more confidence in their application and in the fact that you know, archaeology, archaeology could be mitigated. But really what we'd like to focus on in this is how the baseline gathering actually influenced the master plan. So uh, we weren't just gathering data to um, do an environmental statement, although we were doing that. Um, it was very much, this gave a lot of opportunity for um, design mitigation. Um, <clears throat> so that is really important at this site. Um, that's just a view. Ooh. That one on the left is a view across the site from the race course. You've got the Kent Downs in the background and it's looking towards Western Hanger Castle. I wish I could talk more about the castle. It's a really fantastic site. It's a 14th century um, fortified manor and it's got two incredible 16th century barns which are grade one listed. Um, slightly shielded behind trees and race course buildings at the moment. Um, this is the areas where we've um, currently done um, field work. So Oxford Archaeology did the um, trial trenching. That was preceded by 300 hectares of geophysics. Um, the green areas are the areas that have been geophysically surveyed. Um, <clears throat> then targeted trial trenching. As you can see, the site was pretty busy. <laughs> um, that's the, uh, the geophysical anomalies are on there. Um, from not knowing an awful lot about what the site contained, we've gone from it being very, very, um, very busy. You can see it's a, it's a really rich archaeological landscape. Um, key thing here is a Roman villa that wasn't on the HER, but the geophysics and trial trenching has found. Um, so that's uh, caused a great deal of excitement. Um, this is Western Hanger Castle. Um, you can see that very much the setting of it is within our site. It's landscape, it would have been within a deer park, it would have had formal gardens. It was a royal residence at one point, so clearly um, an important place. But at the moment, you don't really get that sense of it when you're on the race course. Uh, and as I say, it's a, it is in private ownership and it's slightly tucked away. But yes, everything from Mesolithic archaeology, Neolithic, um, we already knew about the barrows, but we found more barrows, plus Bronze Age field systems, early, mid, late Iron Age um, settlements. <laughs> More Roman archaeology, um, for example, here. Some really nice anomalies that we haven't actually trenched yet. So, and um, plus, we've got to have a look at the um, airfields as well and some of the um, military structures. So, uh, we also looked at the um, area to the south of the castle where we think there's a, a Tudor, a walled Tudor garden, and the child trenching does seem to back that up. So, <laughs> Uh, yes, examples of uh, what's found. So we've got the hypercourse, the villa, uh, 
Uh, this is the geophysics of trial trenching on the on the villa site. Um, just an example of some of the finds. As I say, I could probably talk all day about this site, but I've only got ten minutes. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, just showing this. This is a, a previous sort of early iteration of the, the optical master plan. Um, just want to talk a bit about collaboration and how um, what we were data gathering was informing the master plan. We work in an environmental planning team in Arcadis, so we work with ecologists, uh, landscape architects, climate people, hydrologists. Um, so we um, I really just wanted to get across the fact that it's about collaborating and very many disciplines all working together to try and influence um, the master plan and make it a, make a distinctive new town. Okay. Um, yep, yeah, uh, historic maps as you expect. So historic maps, and um, this is the castle area with the tide. Ooh, sorry, tide map. Um, Deer Park Pale on there. Um, this is the original causeway up. Sorry, which we are going to try and um, reintroduce as part of a park that's going to be uh, to the south of the castle. So. And there's water features here. This is the walls, garden or orchard. Um, this is the, the castle here. This, mo this is the uh, race course buildings and the race course itself. So it's basically about trying to draw on the past to celebrate and uh, celebrate it and use use the archaeology to really try and make this a special place. Uh, these are some um, concept designs that our landscape architects worked up, looking at um, the park and how, how we can design it to have a deer park feel, moving up the causeway with um, views opening up to the castle, becoming a slightly more formalised landscape with some kind of recreation of the Tudor Garden as you get closer to the castle, um, maintaining the racecourse lake. This is the current um, illustrative um, plan for the castle park. Obviously, it's going to have high density, uh, well, high and medium density housing around it, but it's 27 acres of um, parkland to the south. Um, okay, right. So, we're really trying to create a setting um, that's going to make a real feature of the castle. We've also preserved the, um, the barrows within the master plan and the villa, which I talked about before, and um, a large amount of the airfield is going to be preserved under the green space. But I just wanted to focus on the castle, just um, can't talk about everything. <clears throat> it's uh, hopefully also to thin out some trees um, that are currently sort of blocking the castle and um, make it more of a recognisable feature and actually give people an idea of its setting and enhance its setting. There will be mitigation, preservation by record, obviously, um, and we can't preserve everything, um, but uh, we are actually, at, there's about 50% green space within this development, uh, that's, where the, um, that's going to be a village green where the barrows are. So hopefully we achieve something for heritage and for, um, we've actually helped the client achieve their vision. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Laura. Laura, sorry, because <laughs> I'm taking up too much time. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about legacy in a minute. Thank you very much. Um, so as Kate was talking about there with the Osborne site, um, there's a real hope that what can be achieved there is something that actually enhances some of the aspects of the heritage of that area. Obviously, part of it will be mitigated as well, so it's it's a it's a mixed picture. Um, so moving on to uh, back to uh, the feeder nine project, um, I'm not going to talk in huge detail about mitigation you did there, um, but obviously the key consideration with this project because of the nature of it, um, it's an infrastructure project. It's going to be a very <laughs> pipeline, so we're not looking at the uh, the kind of the the long term operational setting kind of changes um, that Kate has been talking about. Um, so the, the key change um, is actually during the construction phase. Obviously, any archaeology that would be impacted is being impacted at construction um, as well. Um, so just in brief, and I apologise because I'm not actually going to talk very much about the archaeology that we found here. 
Um, but just in brief, we uh, had areas of open area of excavation, um, and we had a watching brief as well. Let me go and see if I can use the laser pointer. Right, so we had a watching brief on this side, um, and then open area of excavation over here, and then this was a hall road that needed to be constructed um, to allow the construction uh, traffic um, access because they couldn't do this uh, bend in the road here. <laughs> Um, so there was open air excavation there as well. Um, this is sorry, this is the main Box Hill site up here, uh, where we found um, a mix of uh, Iron Age and Romani British um, features, um, small scale settlement, and possibly some salt production as well. Um, and then at the Hall Road to the south of the Box Hill site, um, there was evidence for early medieval um, kind of land management, possibly water management features. Um, so this is still uh, in going through post excavation at the moment. Um, OA North are doing that. Thank you very much. Um, so that one's kind of in progress at the moment. Um, what I want to talk a little bit more detail about regarding litigation was the fact that <clears throat> for the client, the timing of this, as so often, and particularly with infrastructure, was really crucial. They needed to make sure that their new pipeline was in and it was all ready and operational before any actual damage occurred to the existing pipeline. Um, so that was very, very key. And so through doing the pre-application assessments, um, we were able to kind of develop the, the mitigation strategy and have those conversations with the client quite early on. <laughs> Sorry, I've just seen that with my group, haven't I? Um, so I will briefly sum this up. So having those conversations early on allowed to be planned into the construction programme. And... Um, we, uh, we were able to kind of make sure that there wasn't any impact on that. So the archaeology was completed on site, um, pretty much to schedule, um, and the construction was able to proceed um, along, their, along their program as they wanted. Um, the other thing we did was uh, collaborate with our ecology colleagues because there were some um, important bird species along the Humber Estuary and there were some badger sets in the area as well. So that's just about kind of making sure everyone's kind of involved in the conversation and knows what needs to be done. Um, very quickly, we're going to talk very briefly about legacy. Um, so for this project, these are some pictures of the, uh, the strange brick-built feature that I mentioned earlier that we found when we were doing a walkover. And um, when we got back to the office, we had a look, we knew there was a, a bombing decoy recorded in the area, um, but it wasn't, it was just on the corner of Midway to Grid Square, so we weren't sure where it was. Um, anyway, we weren't 100% sure still what this was, but we, um, we fed back to the HER and they subsequently um, did a, a survey of it, a proper survey rather than the sort of sketch plan we've done um, with the local historical and archaeological society. Um, and it transpires that it is definitely a bombing decoy. Um, and the application for scheduling was submitted and it has subsequently been scheduled. Um, so this is where it is in relation to uh, the site at Gox Hill. Um, and these are just some quick examples of what it actually would look like in plan. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a plan of the actual one, um, but these are examples from uh, the Hoo Peninsula um, in Kent um, that are the same type, uh, this QF um, oil bomb decoy, which was designed to um, draw fire away from the oil installations at North Kingham Haven, um, just to the south of Gox Hill. Um, the other thing I want to talk about very briefly, <laughs> um, just to finish the, my section of the, the legacy section, um, and this is difficult to illustrate, so I'm just going to leave these pictures up here, um, is that our engagement with the National Grid project team, um, and we work with lots of different people within National Grid over the course of this project, um, most of them didn't have any previous experience of archaeology or heritage, and so by having that interaction with them, um, they basically demystified the process. So they understood what was required, they understood the likely timescales for things, and so hopefully one of the legacies of this project, although it is very difficult to quantify, is that they've taken that knowledge on into their future projects, so it's more of a, a kind of like a, a professional benefit, if you like. And then I'm going to let Kate finish up. <laughs> Sorry, very quickly, because I know I'm going to run a bit. Um, Clearly there's a, a real role for heritage to play in informing a um, sense of identity and um, a place making into a new community and um, there's been studies done on heritage you know, and community cohesion. Um, just wanted to highlight a heritage <coughs> trail that's planned, if, if this development goes ahead, that would um, link up some of the heritage assets on the site and that would be combined with new cycle routes and footpaths that are being planned with, um, that would then link out to existing footpaths and networks. So it's about increasing sort of public engagement and awareness and enjoyment of of their heritage and not just the people who are going to be living there but the people who are hopefully vis going to be visiting as well 
Um, so our research at Arcadis, as well as Oxford's extensive field work, has shown what a rich landscape there is at Otterpool. Um, with a long history of human habitation activity, it's already got um, several distinct sort of heritage identities within it, and we're working to try and reference um, that and to create a place that doesn't just feel dropped into the, the landscape in isolation, but actually has links and references to it. Um, and in a way that people can appreciate and, and engage with. Um, just to summarise, um, <laughs> legacy, there's no legacy without legwork. <laughs> just wanted to make the point of the work that goes in um, early on in the stage and how that can achieve um, a long-lasting legacy. Um, we're creating knowledge, hopefully, not just uh, gathering data. And we're now in the stage of the project where we're thinking about what do we do with all this information and this understanding that we've collected about the site. Uh, how do we explore this, um, the rich heritage? How can that be communicated to various audiences in new ways? This is all slightly aspirational as it hasn't actually started yet, but um, it might be obviously a heritage benefit involves perhaps a conservation of an asset, but a public benefit involves more than that. It's about um, involving um, new audiences and new ways of understanding historic places. Um, and it could be that we need to explore new technologies and creative ways, perhaps through public artworks, um, art projects. Um, we've talked a bit about um, some technical te new technologies um, in terms of... Um... Oh, OK, my time's up. <laughs> but basically... Um, hopefully, Otterpool, if it goes ahead, will be a special place to live and work, which is heavily influenced by its location and its heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you.